This week's Siskel and Ebert review, Sharon Stone gunning for old enemy Gene Hackman in The Quick and the Dead. Three roommates stumble on a corpse and a small fortune in Shallow Grave. And two phone scam artists create mayhem in The Jerky Boys. Sharon Stone and Gene Hackman star in The Quick and the Dead, a western about a gunslinging competition where only one of the contestants can survive. It's one of the new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert, along with The Jerky Boys and a strange documentary about a man named Crumb. We'll also have a report on Star's ideas about saving the movies. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is The Quick and the Dead. And here's a picture that's well made, has an attractive cast, is full of action, and yet I was thoroughly bored. Why? It's just a repetitive fast draw contest as Sharon Stone plays a mysterious lady who rides into the town of Redemption and finds herself in the company of a bunch of quick draw artists, including young Leonardo DiCaprio, the talented young star of What's Eating Gilbert Grape. But he's all just mannerisms here, no depth of character. So damn fast I can wake up at the crack of dawn, rob two banks, a train and a stagecoach, shoot the tail feathers off a duck's ass at 300 feet, and still be back in bed before you wake up next to me. Another fast gun is the town's mean down, mayor, played down. by Gene Hackman, playing much the same bully boy role that he had in Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven. All I hear from you, you spineless cowards, is how poor you are. How you can't afford my taxes, my protection. And yet somehow, you've all managed to find the money to hire a professional gunfighter to kill me. And another gunfighter is played by Lance Henriksen. And the whole rhythm of this picture is that a character is introduced, performs a stunt, and then gets ready for the big shootout. Thank you. It's a neat trick. I heard you blew a little girl's thumb off in Reno doing that. I am the best you'll ever see. So I keep hearing. Shall we find out? Naturally, there's a verbal showdown between Hackman and Sharon Stone. Try to leave town, my men will kill you. You refuse to fight, my men will kill you. You had your chance to quit. Now it's gone. <laughs> The Quick and the Dead was directed with high energy by Sam Raimi, who made Dark Man, but to bolster an empty story, he resorts to cartoon-like gimmicks of having bullets make outlandish holes in bodies so that you can see right through them, sort of like Al Cap's bullet holes, remember, in Fearless Fostic? That's why The Quick and the Dead seems so empty. Ultimately, it's just a carnival game. Yeah, I felt the same way. This is basically high noon, and the clock is stopped yeah. at noon. It's always high noon, and whenever that little uh, minute hand goes over to the 12, two guys are shooting it out on Main Street over and over again. And you're right, though, about Sam Raimi, and he has some visual wit here. There's one scene where a guy walks into a saloon door, and he casts a shadow that is about three blocks long. That was good. And I also like the bullet holes, Gene, because at least I hadn't seen it before in a movie. So I enjoyed the fact that he was pushing on the visual level, but I feel the story was just the same thing over and over. I think he has to push it because he doesn't have a story. Okay, next movie. Our next film is Shallow Grave, which is the flavor of the month over in Britain, where they think it's one of the best thrillers in a long time and it's breaking box office records. The movie tells the story of three snobs who are roommates in Edinburgh and take pleasure in humiliating and mocking applicants who come to rent the extra room in their flat. When you get up in the morning, how do you decide which shade of black to wear? Okay, I'm going to play just a few seconds of this tape. I'd like you to name the song, the lead singer, and three hit singles subsequently recorded by him with another band. 
They finally find a suitable applicant and rent to him only to discover the next morning that he's dead. Then what do they find in his room but a suitcase filled with an enormous amount of money? They're tempted to keep it, but for a little while they battle with their scruples. Well, go ahead then, telephone. Telephone the police. Go ahead, no one's gonna stand in your way. Telephone them, tell them. Tell them there's a suitcase full of money and you don't want it. Of course, keeping the money means disposing of the body, so they buy the necessary tools. Oh, this is what we need. And then they have to face the fact that someone is actually gonna have to deal with the corpse. I can't do it. The running gag in Shallow Grave is that these three yuppies dig themselves deeper and deeper into graves of their own after hiding the money, disposing of body parts, and dealing with tough guys who come looking for their dead friend. As an idea for a movie, this is probably a good one, but unfortunately, the movie has two big problems. The characters are such one-dimensional twerps that we don't care at all what happens to them, and the plot tries, though it would dearly love to go over the top like the Coen Brothers' Blood Simple, but it fails. The big final scenes play like an exercise from screenplay class. I had the exact same reaction. I detested the characters right from the get-go, uh, and I didn't think that the film had any wit to this no. macabre situation. It didn't play it like uh, like the trouble with Harry, mm -hmm. uh, with Hitchcock, and it, it isn't as strong uh, and, and visually interesting as the Coen Brothers' Blood Simple. I think those are the, the, those are the, the territory that could have been done well, yeah. and they don't do it at all. Coming up next, their comedy CDs make people laugh, but can they make it in the movies? The Jerky Boys. Hey, stop screwing around on that telephone. You got a better idea? Get on the damn radio. Elite Harbosh. Uh, camp number 1557. What to speak to dispatch, please? Those two guys are the Jerky Boys, a couple of comic pranksters who have fun making weird phone calls to people and tape recording their responses. And the results have made a couple of successful CDs. I've never heard their act, but I'm sure it has all the appeal of the calls we used to make as kids to the local delicatessen, <laughs> you know, asking them if uh, he had King Oscar in a can, and if so, let him out. And you know, that's kind of funny if you're 12. But I don't think this new Jerky Boys movie is as funny if you're 11. There's no script here. The two guys, Johnny Brennan and Kamal Ahmed, pretend to be a mobster from Chicago on the phone, and they try to intimidate a real mobster overacted by Alan Arkin. Ernie, what are you trying to get cute with me, baby doll? Come on, what are you trying to make me feel funny in the pants? What's up? Don't oh, suck on my pants and tell me it's raining out there, tough guy. You know, this is getting out of line now. I ought to split your brains from the back of your knees to the front of your face. You got that? Listen here, shoe face! You want to come to New York and have a sit down, that's fine. Just ask me nice. Talk to me like a person. Another would-be gag, one of the boys oh, pretends to be a cranky oh, old man. Oh, I got hemorrhoids bad. My hiney's killing me. I need help. Sir, I'd appreciate it if you use the proper terminology. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm really in a lot of pain, though. Look, how do you cure this? What do you do? Do you jag me? Do you poke at me? What do you beat these things off with a stick? Now, I thought Ace Ventura Pet Detective last year was a sloppy piece of filmmaking, and it was. But the Jerky Boys is much more disjointed, and if it becomes a hit, well, our young audiences are even less demanding of quality than I thought. But they're not, Gene. They do demand quality, because I saw this movie at a Saturday matinee oh. filled with Jerky Boy clones who were wearing their jackets hanging off their shoulders and T-shirts coming out of, flannel shirts coming out of, you know, like the layered look uh -huh. with the pants that are three feet too long and yeah. so forth. And they walked out of the theater saying, boy, that sucks. <laughs> and I was just right behind them saying, right on, you have taste, because this Good. movie is so unbelievably bad. There isn't yeah. one laugh in it. There isn't one moment of interest in it. It right. is a completely bankrupt production. Well, it was also so sloppy in the way it was put together. Yeah. In other words, it was like, we don't even have to make an assemblance of making a movie. That's what probably startled me. Is I, it was, like I was watching a rough draft of something. You got it. When we come back, a documentary about the underground comic artist R. Crumb and his amazing life and times and family. Uh, 
probably the next thing I'm most well known for. I'm just trying to like, you know, hook you into who I am here, you know. This sold millions of copies. I got $600 from CBS Records in 1968. The drawing style is familiar there to anyone who's been following popular art for the last 30 years. It belongs to Robert Crumb, who came out of underground comic books in San Francisco in the 1960s and is now considered one of the great formative influences in comics and satire over the last three decades. And if that were all that the new documentary Crumb was about, it would be enough. But Crumb, one of the most painful and revealing documentaries I've ever seen, is about a whole lot more. It begins with Crumb explaining how much of his work is directly inspired by the wounds and hurts he experienced while he was growing up. If girls would see that I was more kind and sensitive, that they would like me more. And they were kind of impressed by the fact that I could draw, but I couldn't understand why they liked these cruel, aggressive guys and not me, because I was more kind and sensitive and everything, more like them. I was more like them. I didn't realize that they didn't want you to be like them, basically. Then we get a glimpse of his dysfunctional family, including his brother Charles, who was his greatest influence, who started Robert on the road to cartooning, but who dropped it himself and everything else. Charles hasn't left his mother's home in 30 years. <laughs> what was your mom like when you were a kid? She was an amphetamine addict, and these amphetamines would make her act real crazy and do and say all these really crazy things. It had an absolutely devastating effect, I think, on all five of us kids. Another brother, Max, practices strange dietary and religious disciplines. He is also a naturally gifted artist. When I had that first epileptic fit, was in the sixth grade, I was drawing this picture of my face with charcoal in art class. I said, hey, man, you can draw. Look at this. You know, started working out. You know, it's the first time I had this, like, artistic experience, you know. And it was so violent to me that I had a seizure. The movie includes commentary on Crumb's work by his friends and critics who react to its strong and deliberately offensive subject matter. Here's an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about in Ooga Booga. It's actually a mockery of black people. Yes, Crumb's work is offensive, and it's meant to be. But after seeing this documentary, we understand that he's not simply drawing these images for fun or to make money. He's drawing them because he has to. Seeing Robert Crumb, learning about his background, meeting his family, we understand that his work, which is dismissed in some quarters as merely cartoons, are a lifeline. It's all that keeps him functioning in a precarious and tragic existence. The movie was directed by Terry Zweigoff, a friend of Crumb's, and he realized Crumb would have never let a stranger get this close. All I can say is, this is one of the most extraordinary and riveting films of the year, and if you see it, you will not forget it. Well, Roger, you know, just last week I said I don't expect to see a better film this year than Crumb, and I'm sure I won't, because this is, this is why I go to the movies, to be taken into a human life, in this case, three lives, mm -hmm. and a family. And we learn things about, you talked about the artistic impulse, and isn't it refreshing to get that high flown in thinking about a movie? You know how rare yeah. it is to hear, you hear yourself talk like that about a picture? Well, how about this? Have you seen a picture that showed you more about sibling relationships? Mm -hmm. about, how about parents? raising children and the influences they have. This is a great family drama. Mm -hmm. Now, we've seen two documentaries in the last uh, year. Hoop Dreams, a great family story and influencing kids, and here, this crumb. I, I rank them together in quality. Well, it's a great film, and one of the most amazing things about it is that anyone would allow this kind of a film to be made about them. We're not surprised that the Hoop Dreams people allowed themselves to be filmed. They, yeah. they look pretty wonderful in that film, but yeah. in this film, what Crumb is doing is really letting the pain of a lifetime be right there on the screen. And as you look, there's a sequence where we go through, shot by shot, one of the sequences of one of his comic oh, yeah. panels. And it's really rough stuff. And yet, then they pull back and they begin to get into exactly where that came from. Or in another case, the bully that figures in all of his work is a real person who yes. he really still hates from high school. Or the girl that he always wanted to go out with in high school, and it's all right there. He's wearing his heart right there in, on the screen, and, and it's so and moving. And every artist could tell the same I've, stories. Very few would. I'm, I'm yeah. sure that's absolutely true. This movie is not coming out until April. The reason we're mentioning it early is, frankly, we want to get it as many playdates in as many cities as we possibly can. Crumb, demand it in your local movie theater. Coming up next, many of today's biggest stars offer some ideas on how to make American movies better. Was not a good year for American movies. And so I went to Los Angeles to ask a whole bunch of stars the same question. How would they make better movies if they ran Hollywood? I think we need a variety 
different kinds of films. We should not try to second guess the audience. We should go with our heart, our gut, our instinct. You want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? Dumb and Dumber, of course, that's the title of the genuinely funny Jim Carrey comedy, but it also applies to the direction of American movies. For example, the awful Flintstones became a $130 million smash this past summer. By comparison, the intelligent quiz show was rejected by audiences, only grossing $23 million this winter. Do you have any idea how much Bozo the Clown makes? If I made you a studio boss, what would you do on day one to improve American movies? Uh, I'd just uh, maybe call a meeting and say, do things that haven't been seen before instead of kind of recreating old things. Look at the Chaplin movies, see, see what he did, see how he, instead of just kissing a girl, he made it into something, he made it into a moment. Now, I guess that's what I would go after. They, they take all of these ideas and all of these numbers and all of these ratings and then they average them out for this average person that doesn't exist. Instead of letting each person love the part of the movies they're gonna love, hate the part of the movies they're gonna hate, and have real feelings about characters instead of making them all so benign. Part of the problem, Hollywood films are better at producing special effects than fresh dialogue. And those special effects are costly. The hit True Lies cost more than $100 million to make. I don't think it's small-mindedness. I think it's just incredible back-breaking pressure in order to make money and show a profit. The dilemma that the executives face is the rising cost of production and marketing movies. And uh, movies have to draw such a large audience that it's, it's sort of a paradox has evolved where what happens is, is that you have to then take the safer road because you have to, your films have to appeal to a larger audience to be able to make your negative costs back. So what happens is stories become homogenized and in a sense bland. If there was a dominant suggestion from the stars I talked to, it was to pay more attention to the written word. Uh, the first thing I do is let uh, actors act a lot more, talk a lot more, do the things that they normally do. Um, coming from the theater, well, the way we did in Pulp Fiction, we were actually allowed to talk. Um, we finally discovered that actors talk uh, approximately, what, 15, 20 minutes in an hour and a half film. I get some of the novelists to come in and write some of our screenplays so that we'd have better stories. Curiously, the biggest supporters of American movies just the way they are are two foreign-born stars. American movies at this moment, uh, they are so popular all over the world that I don't, I don't, I don't see anybody that can uh, beat with them. I love our industry. I love the studios. They're fabulous. I guess when you make a minimum of $15 million a picture, the status quo is just fine. But obviously, we need more attention paid to screenwriting. And I'll give you a couple more ideas. For journalists, I think they ought to de-emphasize the reporting of the week's box office results and maybe put a limit to the money mania that's infecting Hollywood coverage. And also, for older members of the audience, over 40, well, I think you've got to get to movies faster and support pictures of intelligence. Kids are running away with the opening week's grosses, and movie executives decide what films to make in the future based on early returns at the box office. I really agree with what Sam Jackson had to say, which is, let's get back to people talking to each other. Uh -huh. In his movie, Pulp Fiction, in the new movie, Before Sunrise, it's really refreshing to hear dialogue that is brightly and smartly written. It's a precious commodity. When we come back, some say the most gifted clown of the silent screen was Buster Keaton, and now some of his classic work is available for the first time on home video. The Plaza, offering the finest in luxury, service, and Southern California style, adjacent to Beverly Hills on LA's fashionable west side, the Century Plaza Hotel and Tower. The most famous of the silent clowns is, of course, Charlie Chaplin. But many people believe that the greatest of them all was the sad-faced Buster Keaton, and I'm one of them. A great many of his features and short subjects have never been available on either tape or disc, however, until this month, when to celebrate the 100th anniversary of his birth and of the cinema itself, the silent screen works of Buster Keaton, virtually complete, are finally available for the first time in the art of Buster Keaton. The box sets on both tape and laser disc include famous feature-length films never available on video before, and one of them is Sherlock Jr., the inspiration for Woody Allen's Purple Rose of Cairo. In it, Buster plays a projectionist who walks right into the screen and joins the life of a movie.
The Art of Buster Keaton is our video pick of the week and a good way to kick off the celebration of the centenary of the movies. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed this week. Two thumbs down for the flashy but repetitive The Quick and the Dead, which is basically a series of shootouts in search of a plot. Two more thumbs down for the British thriller Shallow Grave, which has the makings of a good film but saddles itself with unworkable characters and a plot that never takes off. Two big thumbs down for The Jerky Boys, a depressing exercise in how to be boring and obnoxious in a bad movie. <laughs> But finally, two very enthusiastic thumbs up for Crumb, an amazing film about a dysfunctional family and the comic art genius it produced almost in spite of itself. Terry Zweigoff's portrait of Robert Crumb is one of the most unforgettable documentaries we have ever seen. And that is opening in April around the country. People should mark it down on their calendars now because it's going to be a great experience. A great experience. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of more new movies, including Just Cause, starring law professor Sean Connery and detective Lawrence Fishburne battling over a condemned murderer. I don't hear any evidence. But we didn't need any. We had a confession. And the Brady Bunch movie, the big screen version of the 1970s TV sitcom. That's next week. And until then, the balcony is closed.